Um, please stand for the reading of God's word. It's on page 555, if you have a Bible from the back. It's Proverbs 3, 3 through 4. Never let loyalty and faithfulness leave you. Tie them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, and then you will find favor and high regard with God and people. Perfect. You can be seated. <laughs> Thanks, Casey. No, it's great. All good. Well, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, it is a gift to be together. Uh, again, my name is Logan. I serve as one of the pastors here. Uh, and a little bit more family news. If you uh, were a little bit taken aback why I didn't invite Matt and Devin up during our uh, commissioning prayer for the shooters, they are at Ligonier Camp in Pennsylvania. They have the opportunity to lead worship and speak at a middle school camp uh, this week. And so be praying for them. Uh, middle schoolers are their own unique thing. And so it's gonna be a blessing for Matt and Devin to be there. Uh, but please keep them in your prayers this week as the Lord uses them as well uh, to communicate his truth uh, to that group. And so excited for them to have that opportunity. Um, so raise your hand if you have a favorite sitcom. Any sitcom fans or just like sitcoms in general? Okay, maybe about half and half. That was great. Um, so we're gonna take a little poll. I have a list of 10 sitcoms and I want you to mentally track, keep track in your mind of how many of these that you have seen at least one episode of. Not that you've heard about, but that you've actually seen at least an episode. So here is the list. The Beverly Hillbillies, Leave It to Beaver, The Andy Griffith Show, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Family Matters, Home Improvement, Full House, The Brady Bunch, Everybody Loves Raymond, and finally, The Middle. So did anybody get all 10? Has anybody seen? Okay, that's impressive. I love it. Excellent. Who got uh, five or more? Okay, excellent. Well, good. Good, good, good. So sitcoms uh, are fun. They're enjoyable. Uh, but part of the draw is that they are so relatable, right? You think about these families and you think about the struggles and issues that they have as a family or maybe the husband, wife, or maybe the kids. And so we think like, yeah, I get it. Like I understand. I know what that's like. And so it, it struck me again, thinking about our time together today, um, just how important the family continues to be in our culture. We can argue and talk about the state of all, our culture, but the family still has a, an influence, is still knit pretty deeply in the fabric of today's world. And so for our Proverbs series today, we've been going through Proverbs throughout this summer and looking at different topics. Today, we're gonna look at the topic of family. And so we're gonna think about physical family relationships. Certainly our, our spiritual family is important and worth talking about. But today we're gonna to think about um, parents and siblings and husband and wife, the family that you are physically born into or adopted into or fostered into or married into or in some other way grafted into. And so for us to remember that families are a gift of God. God has given us the blessing of family and they can be an incredible source of joy. But they can also be difficult and hard and bring pain. And the beauty of the gospel is that the Lord meets us in any of those places all across that spectrum. And so as we dig into God's word today, if this topic starts to stir up some of those emotions for you, know that God sees you and God loves you. And unfortunately, we can't address every family situation today. Our family you know, specifics are as different and vast as the amount of people here in this room. And so my sermon-wide disclaimer for today is that as we hear what scripture is saying to us, 
with the help of the Spirit and the help of the rest of Scripture, I encourage you to see what God is calling you to do in your given context, in your given situation, in your given circumstance. And so there's a little bit of contextualization I'm putting on you to think through these truths and think, how can I live these out in my specific context? And so our groundwork for today, our framework is the verses that Casey just read that we read together. So this is Proverbs 3, verses 3 through 4. So again, it says this, never let loyalty and faithfulness leave you. Tie them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will find favor and high regard with God and people. And so those two truths of loyalty and faithfulness are gonna be our anchors as we think about family relationships. Favor and high regard are gonna be our goals. How can I achieve those things in my different relationships? And these go hand in hand with the definition of wisdom we've been using this whole series. How can I best love God and love other people in this situation? How can I have loyalty and faithfulness? How can I pursue favor and high regard in these situations? And so we'll cover uh, four different family situations. Our first one will be kind of broad or general relationships. So immediate family, extended family, siblings, parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, etc. All right, with this kind of a broad covering of who we're talking about. So don't raise your hand, but think about, have you ever been offended by a family member? I imagine that most, if not all of us, would raise our hands. Now let's flip it. Have you ever offended a family member? A little bit closer to the heart, but again, I imagine most, if not all of us, would, could say, yes, I have both offended and been offended. And so maybe the offense came from losing out on the shotgun seat on the family trip where you have to spend eight hours in the back seat. Maybe offenses happen over topics of religion or things we've already mentioned today, politics. And so you're already kind of getting antsy or nervous about Thanksgiving dinner this year. Maybe it's from hurtful words spoken to you, words that continue to play out or to, that you continue to hear over and over and over again in your mind. Well, the Lord knows our heart's tendencies when we're offended. And so listen to Proverbs 18, 19. This will be on the screen. It says, an offended brother is harder to reach than a fortified city, and quarrels are like the bars of a fortress. And so I imagine we've all seen, either in person or on TV shows, some depiction of a fortified city. Here's one picture to kind of think about. We've got the high walls, we've got the gates. Maybe it's got a moat around it, or maybe it's built on a hill for a better advantage. And so what's the purpose of fortifying a city? It's to keep people out, right? We build the walls, we build the gates so that people cannot come in. They're for protection and security. And don't we do that very same thing when we are offended? We keep people out. We hold people at arm's length. We guard our hearts. We don't engage. Maybe we even cut people off. We even use phrases like, well, he put up a wall, right? Or her, de her defenses are way up. And so we understand, we recognize our tendency to do those things. And then the psalmist also, or the, the one who wrote Proverbs also saw, talks about putting bars on the fortress. And so think about a prison cell with bars on the windows and bars on the doors. What is the purpose of those? It's to keep people in right? It's to keep somebody contained. And so we think about what happens when we sit in our offendedness. It begins to, to stew, right? It festers. We start to think about, or we start to get angry or bitter or maybe even vengeful. And so an offended heart can certainly go into self-protect mode and that can be healthy and good, but it can quickly, if we're not careful, turn into imprisonment. What do we miss when we hold on to offenses and keep people at arm's length? We miss out on the peace of God. 
We miss out on mental, emotional, and physical energy that could be used productively elsewhere, but is instead being sucked away because we're stuck in this situation. We miss out on the beauty and testimony of a potentially reconciled relationship. And so we need to remember as we think about potentially or or think about maybe a specific hard situation, how does God engage with us when we offend him? In fact, it was while we were in the act of offending, we were actively rebelling against God that God sent Jesus to save us. So in light of that truth, we consider verses like Romans 12, 18, which say, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So for us to think, how can I best love God and love the other person in this situation? What role does loyalty and faithfulness, favor and high regard look? What do they play as have those as our first considerations. Again, I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying these are the things the Lord calls us to. We want to have wisdom as we live those out. So general relationships, first thing. Second thing, second relationship, marriage. Got a picture up here. Here we are. That's my wife and I. One of us has changed drastically and one has not changed a bit. (laughs) But thankful for the gift of my wife as we celebrate 17 years this year. Um, So turn over uh, to Proverbs 31. We're gonna sit here for a little bit. And so if you have a Bible, uh, I encourage you to park here. Um, And so as you're turning there, I recognize uh, there may be some emotions being stirred up depending on your background or how this passage has been handled. Uh, It might bring some frustration. You might be rolling your eyes or cringing and thinking, is Logan really gonna go there, really going to Proverbs 31? Uh, This chapter can have a bad rap, but we're gonna dig into it. And I think uh, the Lord has something for us here. So Proverbs 31, if you look at the subheading, says the words of Lemuel or Lemuel. And so this is a shift from the rest of the book. Most of Proverbs is Solomon talking to his son. We have one other section where a king is talking, and then we have this section with Lemuel or Lemuel. Um, And so this is the king Lemuel speaking words that his mom told him. So he is passing down knowledge from one generation to the next. And so we're gonna go down to verse 10 of Proverbs 31, and here's how it starts. It says, who can find a wife of noble character? She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts her, trusts in her, and he will not lack anything good. She rewards him with good, not evil, all the days of her life. And so, okay, so far so good, right? Noble character, we value that. Um, The wife works and she benefits her husband and family, that's great. Uh, But here's where, if we're not careful, the passage can suffocate a wife instead of spurring her on. And so what is this noble wife about? What makes up a noble wife? And we're not gonna have time to read through it, but you can see the next 15 verses talk about this wife's noble character, the things that she does or she is about to call her noble. So to summarize, she's strong, she works hard, she makes money, she is kind to the poor, she enhances her husband's reputation, she, she speaks with wisdom. And so that list for anyone would be incredibly overwhelming. How in the world am I supposed to do all of these things? It's almost like these verses are the template for some of the social media accounts we follow, right? These people who seem to be able to just do it all, right? The one where the wife is always put together, she's smiling out on some nice date with her husband, her kids are always clean, always happy, they're usually engaged in some kind of cultural education experience, she, does, she has a house with no dust, no dirty dishes. It could be in a magazine. And she also finds the time to have some kind of bustling side hustle or even a rewarding full-time career. And so that level of pressure has simply exploded for women. Social media has brought on this pressure of trying to achieve the unachievable. 
The burden that you should be doing all of these things and if you're not, then you're less than, you're behind the game, you're not living up to what you should be. And so if you're a wife and you're here today, listen, okay, that is not God's heart toward you. That is not what God is calling you to, okay? God is not saying, because scripture as, as a whole book denies that we don't earn our worth or earn our value by the things that we do. And so being involved in a dozen different things does not make you more valuable than someone who isn't. So here's what Proverbs 31 is saying. It is a call to wives to do what God has called you to do well. Do the things that God has called you to do well. It's a call to quality, not quantity. A wife is not noble because of how many things she's involved in. She's noble because of the excellence she brings to the things that she does do. So there is, uh, there can be a lot of shame in our culture particularly toward wives, and we include moms in that as well, for these pressures to do all these things. And again, that is not God's call for you. And so I wanna share a quote from Ray Ortland. He's a former pastor, theologian, speaking to wives who may find themselves kind of burdened by this pressure. So he says, when God wanted a wife for your husband, he reached across an infinite expanse from heaven to earth, to arrange the whole flow of history to bring you to your man. God sees you as the ideal woman for your husband or your husband-to-be. God sees you as a precious gift under Christ. God values you and God's strong affirmation of you is where you get new strength to keep growing into more and more personal excellence. So wives, the call is for you to identify What the Lord, not the world, is inviting you into, is giving you to do. He has called you to himself. He has called you to your husband. If you have kids, he has called you to them. Beyond that, that's between you and the Lord. Some people he calls to a multitude of responsibilities, and some people he calls to have a very small circle. So invite the Lord in to show you what he has for you. And ask yourself that question, how can I best love the Lord and love your husband in your role as a wife? What does loyalty and faithfulness look like in the role that God has called me to play in regards to my husband? And again, a lot of variation and nuance there, but what is the Lord calling you based on your situation? And then husbands, we also have a role to play in this, right? We are not, uh, we are not forgotten. We have an important uh, role to play. And so jump to the end of Proverbs 31, starting in verse 28. We read this. It says, her children, so the same woman we just read about, her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also praises her. Many women have done noble deeds, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord will be praised. Give her the reward of her labor and let her works praise her at the city gates. And so a shorter amount of verses to be sure, right? Compared to the 15 to the women, but to the wives, but we have a lot packed in here. And so what do we see the husband doing in these few verses? First, he praises his wife. He lifts her up. He sees the things that she does and he vocalizes his appreciation for them. He doesn't just think, man, I really appreciate that or my wife did a great job. No, he says it, he tells her, he puts it into words so that she knows that he sees her and he appreciates her. So for husbands, one question for us to ask, do you appreciate the gift of your wife? Do you value her? Do you cherish her? Do you see her? Do you acknowledge the good that she adds to your life? Do you not just think those things, but vocalize those things to her? Do you recognize the ways that your wife excels, the ways that she specifically is gifted and the things that she does well? 
Ephesians 5, 28 through 30 says, in the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. So husbands, does that describe you? Do those verses hit the mark of how you live your life with your wife? If you have children, are you teaching them to honor their mom? We saw in verse 28, her children rise up and call her blessed. Where did they learn to do that? It's from the husband. The husband taking the lead and modeling appreciation and praise for his wife, for their mom. They're following dad's example. So husbands, how do you talk about your wife outside the home when you're around the water cooler at work? You know, yeah, we've had leftovers three times this week. Like how hard can it be to make a nice meal? Or if you're out and you get a phone call from your wife, oh, there's the old ball and chain. Don't do that. Don't do that. We see give her, in verse uh, 31, give her the reward of her labor and let her works praise her at the city gates. So who is praising the works of this woman at the city gates? Well, we go back to verse 23 says, her husband is known at the city gates where he sits among the elders of the land. So this husband is at the place of prominence at the gates of the city talking about how great his wife is. How amazing is that? What a beautiful picture for this husband to be so thankful and so proud of his wife that he's telling everybody. He's telling the elders at the gates. He's telling merchants that are coming in, my wife is amazing. Husbands, are we doing that? Here's Ray Ortland again, this time talking to us husbands. He says, what does the word husband mean? We have the related English word husbandry, that is cultivation. And when the word husband is used as a verb, it means to cultivate. So if you are a husband, here is your job, to cultivate and nurture your wife. Your lifetime impact on your wife should be so that her life opens up more and more and she is enabled to become all that God wants her to be. God is calling you as her husband to care for her so that in latter years, she will be thinking, what a great life I've had. My husband understood me, he cared for me, he inspired me to grow in Christ. Husbands, what, what better thing could be said from your wife than those words. Loyalty and faithfulness, husbands. How can you love the Lord best, love your wife best in your marriage, lifting her up and valuing her? That's the question for us to consider. So moving right along, now we're gonna get to uh, parents and children. So always a great conversation. So thankful for the gift of children. And so first, the parent to the child. So we're gonna look at another popular proverb. You can flip over here if you want to, but it'll be on the screen. Um, Proverbs 22, six. And this is one of those proverbs that I bet would be uh, in the, toward the top of the list if we could choose a proverb to actually be a promise, right? Proverbs, if we remember, are speaking about probabilities. They're giving principles, but they are not promises. They're not guarantees. They don't say, if you do X plus Y, then Z will always happen. But this is a proverb that, man, I know lots of us wish that would be a promise. Here's what it says. Start a youth out on his way, even when he grows old, he will not depart from it. Or oftentimes it's quoted, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it or stray from it. And so we hear these words um, and in my mind, it kind of brought up the picture of pin the tail on the donkey. Has anybody ever been to a birthday party and played the game pin the tail on the donkey? Maybe it's been a few years. Maybe you play that with your kids, but you know how the game goes. There's a picture of a donkey on the wall and it's tailless. And so each child gets a pin or some other kind of, uh, some of that sticky tack maybe, and you get blindfolded. And your goal is to get the tail as close to the rear end of the donkey as possible. But here's the catch. Usually when you get the blindfold on, you get spun around, right? You get disoriented. 
But also, hopefully, if the person who is doing the spinning is nice, they will point you, set you, start you in the direction of the donkey, right? So you have at least a general idea of where you need to go to hopefully win the game. And so we think about the call that God has to parents. There is much in the world that threatens to disorient our kids. There's a lot of messages, a lot of voices, a lot of expectations that are counter to what God is calling them to do and to be. They need us as their parents to show them the good way of Jesus. It is not by accident that you have the kids that you have. God saw it fit in his sovereign wisdom to give you those kids because you are the one or the ones that he wants raising them. He sees it best for them to grow up in your family so that you ultimately can point them to the Lord. And so we wanna take every advantage that we can to do that. Hear these words from Deuteronomy 6, a very kind of famous section when it comes to parenting. It says, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. Do you get the picture? Talk about God, talk about his commands. Instruct your children in every opportunity you have. In structured times of family worship and in informal times when you're driving to the store. Talk about the Lord. There's nothing more important. So with all the messages bombarding our kids through friends and media and variety of other situations, they have to hear from us about God and faith. We can't take a back seat to this. We think about even the context of Proverbs, the, the bulk of the book is Solomon, a dad, saying this, these wisdom phrases to his son. Solomon in this book is starting his son on the way of knowing God. So parents, it's up to us to create and take advantage of avenues for faith conversations. We wanna ask good questions. There's a, pl a plethora of resources available, but simply the Bible is a great thing to use, the best thing to use. Pray as a family, serve, create rhythms, and even liturgies that you repeat at different times to, to point your hearts to the Lord. And I want us to remember who we're dealing with here, right? The proverb says it's a youth, it's a child. It's somebody who is probably young, certainly inexperienced, certainly still developing, likely in every aspect, learning about who they are. And so this isn't an easy call. Faith conversations don't come naturally to us and probably certainly don't come naturally to our kids. And so kids are gonna cry. They won't sit still. They'll get off topic or even not wanna participate at all. You might be tired and drained from the day and not wanna engage in these important conversations. And so for us to take the pressure off of, well, these faith conversations or maybe family worship has to look a certain way and we have to block out 30 to 45 minutes and do like we do on Sundays with three songs and a prayer and a scripture reading, like it doesn't have to be that way. That's good. But think about what these faith conversations, what this atmosphere of faith culture looks like in your family. Maybe it's a simple Bible story and a song and a prayer, five minutes. That's great. Because whether you feel like you're dropping $100 bills worth of, of investment in your child's spiritual piggy bank or you feel like all I have is a penny or two, those investments matter and it's gonna make a difference. So continue, so, so start or continue engaging in the things that are important. The last part of that proverb says, when he grows old, he will not depart from it, meaning the faith or the things that we teach our kids. Proverbs 16, 31 says, gray hair is a glorious crown. It is found in the ways of righteousness. 
So for the true believer, when he or she is old, they will know without a a shadow of a doubt that there is nothing that compares to the good news of Jesus. There is nothing that compares to faith in the one true God. And so as parents, it is our responsibility to make those investments. And so what does loyalty and faithfulness look like as you parent? How can you best love God and love your kids when you, as you train them and point them to Jesus? That's the question for us parents. And then finally, kids, don't think we forgot about you. There's things for you to hear as well. And so broadly, all of us are children. And so these things apply to all of us as well. So Proverbs 20, verse 20 is the verse we're gonna look at for this one. It'll be on the screen. It says, whoever curses his father or mother, his lamp will go out in deep darkness. That is a pretty unnerving image. God is serious about how we view our parents. Despising someone, loathing them, scorning them is a serious thing. In fact, we remember the words of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount where he says, you have heard it said, do not murder. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister, and we could include mother or father, will be subject to judgment. And then from the 10 commandments, wisdom statements in their own right, we remember the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. Our parents, by nature of their role in our lives, should be honored. God calls us to that. And so the call for the kids in this room, but again, all of us as children, is to treat our parents with respect. So next time you feel like your parents are driving you crazy, which I'm sure never happens, be mindful of your response. Teens, maybe specifically before you tell your parents you hate them for another rule you think is dumb, check your heart. And certainly God calls us to parent with certain standards as well. But for us to remember that our parents are a gift. And so we need to consider, all of us need to consider as children, we need to consider how can I best display loyalty and faithfulness as I love God and my parents in this given situation. And so some ideas for how to do that, because maybe that comes naturally, but maybe it doesn't. And so something to consider is to think about anything that might, uh, you might be able to thank your parents for. Okay, anything that they said or did or any kind of experience you got to have, thank your parents for the good that they did. Bring attention to them. Share those words of gratefulness. And then second, as you consider your parents' lives, what might you be able to imitate in your own life that was good and helpful? What are the good things that they modeled for you that you can copy? Consider if there's anything you might be able to take on as your own and praise God for that and thank them for that. How can I best love God and love my parents in my child-parent relationship. And so, needless to say, family is a lot. And we flew through these verses today. They're only a small sampling of what scripture has to say. And again, we can't uh, address every single specific situation and nuance. Um, But wherever we find ourselves with our family, here's where we wanna land, is that Jesus had an earthly family and that was sometimes difficult. The son of God, perfection in the flesh, righteousness embodied, didn't have a perfect family life. Now it's not his fault, right? He never sinned. But being in the context of family can be difficult. Jesus wasn't married, he didn't have kids, but at least at one point, his family thought he was crazy, talking about wild things. They wanted to come and remove him from the public square. When he was arrested and tried, everyone deserted him, including his family. And yet he still went to the cross. He still gave his life on behalf of those who would believe. And some of those people were his family. 
We have the book of James that we've talked about, the wisdom book in the New Testament. That's the half-brother of Jesus who came to faith after the resurrection. So we see Jesus displaying loyalty and faithfulness to his family in a beautiful way. He showed how best to love God and love others. And it's his spirit that helps us do the same. So we don't walk alone as believers. We have the power of God helping us even in difficult relationships to seek to honor the Lord and to honor other people. So let's pray. I'm gonna kind of take a page from Casey's book as we've thought about these verses. Um, If the Lord has brought to mind someone in your family that is a blessing, somebody in your family that has brought you joy, someone in your family that has made a positive impact on you, take a moment and thank God specifically for that person. And then kind of the other side of the coin, if God has brought to mind a difficult family relationship, a person in your family that there is, there is hurt or there is offense, I pray or I ask that you would pray for God's help and wisdom in how to engage in that situation and how you should uh, relate to that person. Father, this is another uh, example of of where we need your help. We know that's true across all of life, uh, but I know family can be uh, maybe deeper, Lord, maybe closer to the heart, uh, stickier, um, more difficult. And so, uh, Lord, I pray that you would meet us where we are, as I know that you do, regarding our family. Lord, if if it's a joy to us, Lord, praise you for that. If it's difficult and has some some heartache and some pain, Lord, meet us with your peace and your presence in those places as well. Lord, you have given us our families, again, because of your sovereign wisdom, you have seen it good to be part of our family. And so however we view that or whatever situations we're in right now, help us to hold fast to the truth that you are sovereign, that you are good, and you are working all these things for our good as well. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit that helps us in difficult life situations. We praise you for your love for us today. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.